are in the middle of a series that we began at the beginning of September that we've entitled WIIIFM, What is in it for me? And we've been looking at uh, the life of Jacob from the book of Genesis. And this morning we're going to continue uh, with the life of Jacob. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Genesis 28. We're going to keep, the, you know, keep going with the story of, of Jacob. What we've seen so far in the life of Jacob is that Jacob was not the most intelligent, um, well-behaved dude that you'd ever see in the Bible. And what I love about the Bible is that the Bible is real. It doesn't, it doesn't candy coat and there's, you don't see a Bible full of perfect people that you know, we couldn't possibly live up to. The Bible is full of imperfect people making big, big mistakes, making stupid decisions, and yet God still uses them and moves them. And Jacob is one of those guys. Jacob, what we have seen so far, and we've only been able to make it through a couple of chapters, but what we've seen in Jacob is Jacob had a problem. Jacob had a problem probably more so than, than most, but Jacob was, his problem was he was born second. Now that wouldn't necessarily big, be as big a deal for, for you and f- you know, for me. You know, those of you who are born second here going, I'm not as crazy as Jacob. I didn't think it, you, you know, it's such a big deal. I you know, didn't strive to be. Yeah, my older sibling might have got spoiled a little bit more, but really I got over it. It's not that big a deal. And yet for Jacob, he was obsessed with being second. In fact, he was so obsessed that he spent basically the majority of his life chasing down Esau even though Esau was a twin brother Esau was born first and Jacob couldn't handle that and you know it's a big deal to Jacob because in those days in Jewish you know uh, families and it was you know being born first meant that you were you received the birthright which meant that you got a double portion of of your father's income, you know, when he, you know, as an inheritance, you know, Isaac was one of the wealthiest men on the planet, if not the wealthiest men on the planet at that time. So that was a lot of money. And so I can understand Jacob saying, okay, well, you know, it's for the dough. I, I need, you know, I need to be first. I need to chase Esau down. I should have been born first. But, but Jacob, we saw in, in the first week, he kind of tricked his brother into selling the birthright for a bowl of beans. Now, I don't know how hungry you have to be I could be you know haven't eaten in 50 days I wouldn't sell my worst pair of jeans for a bowl of beans beans is not exactly what I would be craving although when you're hungry you do crave weird things Uh, I've been on diets before and I craved rice cakes That's wrong. (laughs) But (laughs) Jacob ended up tricking his brother to sell him his birthright. But having Esau's birthright wasn't enough. He deceives not only his brother, he deceives his father as well into getting, you know, Esau's blessing. So he got Isaac's blessing, you know, to, you know, has had his father bless him. And he got the birthright and the blessing. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. But, you know, because he tricked his brother into getting the birthright and the blessing, um, Esau, surprise, surprise, wasn't all that happy. And so Esau threatened to kill Jacob. Jacob had to run, run away or merely take another route, um, whichever case may be. But, but Jacob had to run and flee the very things that he wanted He ended up losing because he was dialed into what's in it for me. We're going to pick up the story in Genesis 28 where we see Jacob running from Esau and he has an encounter with God. And before we get to the story, the story kind of addresses a problem. And I I got to be honest with you, as I was studying this part of of Jacob's life, Jacob's story, I literally said to my wife and I said to to Pastor Ralph and to Pastor John, this this is the words that came out of my mouth. I said, Jacob was an idiot. I said that. As I'm reading this, I'm like, Jacob was a stupid, stupid man. And as I said the words out of my mouth, I became convicted myself because of what I looked at. It's so easy to point your finger at somebody else's faults and somebody else's mistakes until that finger comes back to you. And I realized that the same stupidity that Jacob did and what we're going to see him do today and it's really really dumb the thing that Jacob 
did, I've done many times. And in fact, if I was really honest with myself, I probably still do it to some degree. And the issue really comes down to, have you ever bargained with God or negotiated with God? Maybe in a way, in, in, in a way like something like this in your prayer life, you've said something like, God, if you do this for me, I will serve you. I will do this for, for, for you. Anybody ever done that? Okay, a few brave souls are saying, yeah, admit that. If you haven't done that, there's another way that you might have thought this. Maybe you have, like me, and I've done this one as well, maybe when I don't get my prayers answered exactly the way that I think they should be answered or I don't, God doesn't do something for me, I begin to question saying, God, if you're such a good God, why would you allow this to happen to me? I was in conversation with some of our, our pastors this week about this thing and, and you know we were going back and forth and we've literally taken phone calls and had counseling sessions with people, nobody in this room so you're all safe. Um, <laughs> we've literally had counseling sessions where somebody would say something like, my toilet backed up this week, how can a good God allow something like that to happen to me? You're laughing, but you've, and I've thought the same thing. My cat died. How could a good God allow something like this to happen to me? Or in my case, it was something a little bit more serious. When, when my mom passed away seven years ago this week, I began to question God and say, God, Wow, how could a good God allow something like this to happen? How come you didn't answer my prayers the way that I expected them to be? God, I'm not sure I can serve you because you allowed these things to happen to me. Now, the question that we want to ask this morning, and this is a real Deep question, one that I want you to contemplate over the next few minutes, but the question is, what does God owe you? What does God owe you? Another way to ask this question is probably a little bit stronger, a little bit more difficult to answer. If God did nothing for you, God never did anything for you, would you still serve him? God never did an, an, another thing for you, would you still serve him? These are tough questions. Yet, when we look at these questions and begin to ask ourselves these questions, these, these are very real questions. You and I wrestle with these things and we get to the place where even in our relationship with God, we easily dial into what's in it for me, that we serve God as long as he is blessing me. As long as things are going good, it's easy to serve God. And I, what's in it for me? I serve God, I give to God, I do things. And I grew up in, 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 a, in a home, in a Christian home, and I grew up and nobody, I don't, nobody had to teach me this stuff. This is just naturally how I was wired and how human beings, I, I would think, wired is that I thought growing up that as long as I you know, did good and read my Bible and prayed uh, and you know, went to church, I would negotiate with God in my prayer time and said, God, I've been good this week. I I've, been, I've, been, I've been pretty good. I've read my Bible. I went to church. I I've prayed. I I've, I, you know, I treated my brothers with respect. I, 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 did, I did good. I, God, I did good. Therefore, in all confidence, I can come to you in prayer and ask you to now, you, you, now you owe me something. Now you need to bless me because haven't I been so good? Or the, the opposite of that is when you haven't been good, we automatically assume God won't answer. We're not as confident in going to him into prayer. But let me, let me make a statement here. If, 
What does God owe you if God is God? He's God. I'm not. Does God owe me anything? It's it's a big question. I will serve God as long as he does everything I want. Now, in our story with Jacob, we, we see Jacob, we're going to pick up the story in verse 10 of chapter 28, and Jacob is running from Esau, Esau has threatened to kill him, Jacob wisely takes off, and we pick it up, it says, Jacob left, verse 10, Beersheba, and set out for Haran, and, and when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set, taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Now, let, let's just back up a little bit here Jacob has pursued remember Jacob is in his 70s at this point Jacob has pursued the birthright and the blessing of his older brother and he has manipulated and deceived his entire family to giving them these things but yet now he has the birthright and the blessing and the next night that he gets those things he's on the run and he's laying down in the middle of an open field somewhere and the only thing he has for a pillow is a rock and he's laying down I, I can't imagine that being too comfortable and he's laying down and thinking wait a second I just got everything I ever wanted and this is, this is, this is the life I get this is what my life is going to be like and as he goes to sleep look what happens he had a dream okay he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth which its top reaching to heaven and I have a song going through my head um from the 70s right now. And, um, wonder where it got, came from. Anyway, he had a dream. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Wild. He, he sees a stairway leading to heaven. <laughs> a window opens in heaven and there's angels coming up and down the stairway. Then look at, look at verse 13. There above the stairway stood the Lord himself. And he said... I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. God goes on. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. What an amazing promise what an amazing dream God is I mean life is good okay this, you know I'm here I am laying down and my 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 pillow is a is a rock and yet yet you know did I accomplish anything my entire life I got everything I ever wanted did I accomplish everything God shows up in the dream and says yeah you are going to be blessed and and not only that but all of your offspring all the peoples of the earth all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring this is this verse by the way is one reason why I am thankful to have a prime minister who absolutely is defending Israel because the Bible promises that all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through Israel and his descendants. We are blessed. Now, God goes on and he says, I am with you. This is good. And will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you now I'm thinking at this point Jacob's got to be feeling pretty good God shows up gives him all the promises all the things I will be with you wherever you go I am the God of your grandfather I'm the God of your father I will be your God I'll be with you wherever you go I will bless you abundantly and Jacob is thinking man this is life is good this is this is this is great but watch what happens next when Jacob awoke from his sleep he thought wisely surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it surely where I you know I just found an open field and I was not aware that God was here in this place 
And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate to heaven. He goes, man, of all the places, this is the stairway to heaven. This is the gate to heaven. This is the place where God literally lives. And he's got this picture of, wow, God is here. And he's, he's sensing this, this is good so far. Jacob, you're doing good so far. You're, you're doing awesome. You're, you're acknowledging, man, God is really here. This is, this is more than just a dream. This is something spectacular. I just met God. Now, if you had a dream this real, this authentic, you had an encounter with God like this, you would be in awe too. And it'd be good. You'd, you'd probably have a sense of, wow, God is, God is real. Number one, that's cool. God just met me. Wow. I, I, you know, I didn't realize that God was right here and I was not aware of it. But now look at what Jacob does. Early in the morning, he wakes up. Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it, and he called the place, and he began to sacrifice and worship, and this is a form of, of worship, and the, Jacob, you're doing good, and he called that place Bethel. Now, now Bethel is, just simply means house of God, appropriate. I, 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 this is where God showed up. Though the city used to be called Luz. Luz. I'm calling it Luz. Because it represents very well, remember what Jacob's name means? Deceiver, second best, loser. Appropriate, that loser lies down in Loserville. <laughs> Makes sense. And in Loserville, God shows up. Right. Okay? Jacob's going, wow, God was here. This is awesome. Okay? But then... Jacob does something that you and I do all the time is that when we should just shut up and listen to God, we go and do something stupid like opening our mouths and usually when we open our mouths, we say something ridiculous. Jacob makes no exception. Jacob has just encountered God. He has just sacrificed to God. Jacob, you're doing good so far. Now just shut up. Jacob. Jacob, 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 do not say what you're about to say. Look what Jacob says. <laughs> then Jacob made a vow saying, and he started off all wrong. If God, hmm, I've prayed that prayer. Not good. If God will be with me, what did God just promise you, Jacob? If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat, remember, because he's a mama's boy, 76 years old at this point, okay? I had to leave my mama. Who's going to feed me? Oh, I just met God. God, if you will feed me <laughs> and give me clothes to wear, because I'm not sure what to wear without mama. Okay? So that I will return safely to my father's household. Then, whoops, if God, then, if God, then, the Lord will be my God. And at that moment, God goes, well, now that you put it that way, I mean, <laughs> Jacob, I mean, thank you. I just, you know, you're right. You know, uh, you know, all of my kingdom depends on whether or not you make me your God. Jacob, 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 Jacob. And this is the point where I'm thinking, this is why I said to, you know, Pastor John, Pastor Ralph, and my wife, I said, Jacob was an idiot. But the moment I say that, I'm thinking, how many times have I prayed this exact prayer? Maybe not, not about food and clothes and all the rest of it, but how many times have I prayed this prayer that, God, if you will do this for me, then I will serve you. As if God is going, oh. The moment I say a prayer like that, who am I dialed into? God 
What's in it for me? As long as you do for me what I need, when I want, when I ask, how I want it to be, God, as long as you do that, I will serve you. And the moment you don't do it my way, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Jacob, no, 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 no. But at the same time, Jacob is me. That the moment something doesn't go my way, I begin to question God, who he is. Now, as this is not bad enough, Jacob keeps talking. Sometimes you and me and Jacob just need to zip it and listen. Now look at Jacob, Jacob keeps going. And this stone, ooh. as if God's supposed to be impressed. God can take whatever you have. God's not impressed with anything you have or anything you give. God, can, God made it in the first place. God, I'll give you. <laughs> and this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. God, you can live in this rock. Jacob, 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 Jacob. And God's got to be sitting up there going, do you know who you're talking to? And then it gets worse. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. <laughs> and God is going, thank you. I'm, I wasn't sure how I was going to get by next week. <laughs> and while I'm thinking, Jacob, this is so stupid, I'm thinking, how many times have I said, God, if you give me a little bit more money, then I will give more to you? <laughs> Who am I talking to? Who's Jacob talking to? God, I, this is before tithing was part of the law. Jacob says, man, I'll, I'll give you a tenth of everything. You, you give me stuff, I'll, I'll give you a tenth. Well, great, Jacob. And he's thinking that he's doing God some big kind of favor. But listen, this is the thing. You, you can give, you can sacrifice, you can make altars, you can do all these things. But if you do it in the name of you, what's in it for me? If I give to God so that I can get, it's still not the right heart. Who am I serving? Am I serving me? Am I, is God, and if God doesn't bless me with, with, the, with, with you know, abundance, what, it, what, you know, what I expect, do I question everything that he, that who he is and this stuff doesn't work and throw it all out and say, you know, God, come on, you got to bless me according to me. Do I make sacrifices and attend and do all the, all, you, know, you know, read the Bible and attend church and do all these things for me? If I do it for me, who am I really serving? Because let me ask you a question. And here, it's a, it's a big question. If I was to have, I mean, we're not so stupid to have this kind of relationship with our spouse. If you were, if you were dating and you wanted to get married and, and, and get engaged and you would say to somebody, you know what? I will love you as long as you do this and this and this and this and this for me. The moment you stop doing this for me, the moment you stop taking me shopping every week, I won't love you anymore. And the moment the guys start saying, the moment, they say to your wife, the moment you don't fill in the blank. <laughs> I won't love you anymore. Now, what kind of relationship is that? Yet you and I do the exact same thing with God all the time. It's a one-way relationship where God bless me. Do for me. If you don't do for me, I won't love you. I won't serve you. I won't, you won't be my God anymore. I'll find something else to fill that. God, if you disappoint me, if you don't do what I want, if you don't do what I ask when I want it, how I want it, God, I'm out of here. I'm guilty. But there's a better way. 
See, Jacob in his life, what's amazing about our God is God still stays with Jacob, still has patience with his stupidity. God keeps talking to Jacob. Jacob doesn't deserve it. Just like God keeps talking to you. God is patient with you. God is patient with me. And what the Bible shows me is that God still loves me regardless of my stupidity. God still loves me, still blesses me, still you know, reaches out to me. Still, still, He's patient. And that what we see at the end of the story, and you're going to see this next week in a lot more detail, is that what God does with Jacob is absolutely remarkable. And God has patience with Jacob through the first hundred years of his life to get to the place where Jacob finally gets it. And one of the places where Jacob finally gets it is actually in Genesis verse 35. And you'll see this because Jacob... God tells Jacob to return to this very spot, this very spot, this Bethel, this very spot where this encounter happened. Yet when Jacob returns the second time, Jacob's attitude, and this is 20-some years later, Jacob's attitude is remarkably different. Look at this in Genesis 35. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. What's amazing is God is still talking to loser Jacob. God never runs out of chances. What an amazing God. So look at Jacob's response this time. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Instead of saying, I'm the man and God, God should be, God wants to meet with me. It's all about me. Instead of saying that God, Jacob's going, wait, whoa, 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 I'm going to meet with God. You know, I got to get onto his page. Not of Instead of in the first time encounter, he's saying, are, are you, you know, is God's got to get onto my page. God, if you get onto my page and do what I want, I will serve you. This time, Jacob's going, in order for me to meet God this time, I got to get onto his page. There's a totally different attitude here. So he tells his household, get rid of all those things. Then, then he says in, in verse 3, then come, let us go to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress. In the day of his distress, the day of his distress was the day that he got everything he thought he ever wanted. Yet years later, he looks at that and says, that was my day of distress. The moment I got what I thought I had always wanted, I got it my own way, in my own time, and I created my own distress. And he's saying, God met me still when I was so selfish and so stupid. That's the day that God met me, in the day of my distress distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone that even though I was stupid God stuck with me wow so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem and then they set out and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them now listen to me carefully when you get on God's side he gets on your side you can't lose God begins fighting your battles for you that's when Jesus says take my yoke upon you I will give you rest the moment we switch the mentality and we get get on God's side Jacob's doing something different and all of a sudden God is beginning to fight for Jacob and there's a shift here that happens in Jacob's story. In verse 6, Jacob and all the people with him came to Loserville, which is now Bethel, in the land of Canaan. And there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because apparently he wanted a Mexican restaurant. I'm not sure what <laughs> that was all about. But he called it El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. He said, God stuck with me. This is where God met me. And after Jacob had returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. 
appeared to him again. Now look at what God says. And God said to him, your name is no longer loser. But you will no longer be called loser. Second best. Your name will be Israel, which means triumphant with God. And so he named him Israel. And this is a turning point because Jacob came with a different attitude. This is a turning point. And God said to him, look what God says, I am God Almighty. He doesn't say, I am your God. At this moment, he has said, I'm God of Abraham, Isaac. Later he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. I, I, I'm the God of Israel. But at this moment, he's saying something very, very clear to, to Jacob. I am God. You're not. I am God Almighty. I am God. Jacob gets it this time. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. And he goes on, the land that I gave to Abraham. God has already said this to Jacob, but this time Jacob's listening differently. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at that place where he had talked with him. So what does Jacob do? Jacob sets up a stone pillar. See, Jacob does the same thing. He worships, but he worships in the same manner that he did last time, yet this time's with a different heart. Your methods of worship have nothing to do with the methods themselves, has everything to do with your heart. This time he did it differently. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him and he poured out a drink offering just like he did the first time. Same thing, this time is different though. His heart is different. He also poured oil on it and Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. He had already named it Bethel before but for some reason it just emphasizes again. Jacob does it again. This time was different. Here's the difference. Here's a subtle difference between the first Jacob and this Jacob, the first time he came to Bethel, and this time, this is the difference. There's a subtle difference in your life and in my life, and there's a subtle difference in Jacob's approach and, and what he came the first time to where it came the, the second time. And here's the subtle difference. There's a big difference between God is on my side versus I'm on God's side. And here's the subtle difference. And we see it through other stories in the Bible. And God wants you to get to the place where you can be a follower of Christ for years and years and years and years. But when we live life and our relationship with God with, I want God on my side. Now God promises all throughout the scripture to be on your side. But there's a subtle difference where I'm gonna serve God when he does things my way versus I surrender completely to his way one of the best examples in scripture that I can find in, in the subtle differences the best responses ever somebody that responded properly the first time the story of Joshua and Joshua 5 Joshua had just taken over as leader of the Israelites and they're about to to take the land of Canaan and and Joshua, you know, crossed over the river with the whole people. They're about to, you know, conquer Jericho, and, and it's going to be a great battle. And, you know, Joshua early, wakes up early morning, probably nervous about battle, and he goes for a walk early morning. And while he's going for a walk early morning, he encounters the angel of the Lord. And look at hey, this encounter. Look, this is so subtle. This is a big deal. And if you get this, this will change your perspective in life. I'm hoping this, this is going to set you free. Look at this. And then while this, while Joshua was there near Jericho, he looked up and saw right in front of him a man standing holding his drawn sword. And Joshua stepped up to him and said, now the other translations say this is the angel of the Lord or this is Jesus himself with a sword drawn. Joshua knows this is supernatural. Joshua knows this dude isn't, you know, isn't a local. This, this dude, this is guy from heaven. And Joshua looks at this and he, he identifies him right away as an angel of God. Or Jesus himself. And I, think, I picture his next statement kind of arrogantly saying, awesome. <laughs> We're about to kick some butt. 
you know, God and the angel armies are here. This is awesome. And he says, Jake, or Joshua says, whose side are you on? Ours or our enemies? Thinking, you called me. You got me into this. Whose side are you on? And thinking, oh, man, I'm just waiting for Jesus to say, of course I'm on your side, Joshua. Of course I'll fight for you, Joshua. Of course. I called you to this. this of course. I like you best, Joshua. We've got religious battles going on all around the world today still with people claiming that God's on their side. Killing other people, saying God's on my side for, you know, for, for, for God and you know, for our faith and all the rest of it. And this, this scripture is you know, different. I mean, this is the Canaanites, the heathens. Everybody else thinks every other religion is heathen. Isn't that right? And that God's on our side. God likes us best. God likes me best. God's going to bless me because, you know, after all, I please him. Who, God, you're on my side. At work, my boss is not saved. God, you like me best. You're going to promote me, right? You're going to be on my side. You, whatever it might be, we think God's on my side. And, and Joshua says, whose side are you on? And look at God's response. He said, neither. Uh, huh. What do you mean, neither? You called me to this. What do you mean you're not on my side? God, you're on my side. Of course you're on my side. Whose side you're on? Uh Uh-uh. Neither. Who are we serving? God, the creator. Who created the enemies that we're fighting? Whose side are you on? Neither. I am commander of God's armies. I've just arrived. And Joshua's response is different than my response would be. My response would have been, what? What do you mean you're not on my side? But God, I've served you. God, I've, I did everything you told me to do. I've, 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 I've said my prayers this morning. I've done everything you've asked me to do. God, you got me. You called me. I, I'm doing everything you want me to do. What do you mean you're not on my side? But Joshua responded differently than I would have. Joshua fell face to the ground and worshiped he got it and he said he asked what orders does my master have for his servant and what he got right there is he all of a sudden he just got this revelation right in that moment going oh, it's not whether God's on my side it's whether I'm on God's side that's the difference it's not whether God will serve me it's whether I will serve him it's not whether God will do things the way I want it. It's whether I will do what he asks of me. Joshua got it. And his first response is, what are my orders? Now let me ask you this question. In your prayer life, this is the question I'm asking me in my prayer life. Do I place demands on God to do things my way? Or do I ask God, what are my orders? And how you respond in prayer, God, you got to do this for me, you got to do this for me, you got to do this for me. If I place demands on God, I'm doing things my way. But what if in the midst of things not going my way, in the midst of things not, that aren't necessarily make sense, do I say, God, your will be done. Whatever you want, what are my orders? It's a big difference. And look at what... Verse 15, with the, when Joshua says, what are my orders? Look at how God responds. Joshua's thinking, maybe he's even thinking in his mind, go, go kill some people. <laughs> no, no. God gives him a different command, something a little different. God kind of testing. God's army commanded, or Joshua, take off your sandals. Uh, what? <laughs> excuse me? Take your sandals off your feet. The place you're standing is holy ground. And look what Joshua did and didn't go, uh, excuse me, um, Why? Joshua did it. (laughs) Joshua did it. This morning's takeaway is simple. I want you to ask this question of yourself. I want you to post this question on Facebook and watch the responses you're going to get. And the question is simply, what does God owe you? What do I feel God owes me because of how good I've been or how I've done or you know, what kind of person I am or because 
God's on my side. And what does God owe you? And this is a heart question. This is a deep question. What, is, what does God owe me? And I want to caution you when you post this on social media. You're going to get a, a bunch of different responses. Some of those responses, because we live in a very hurting, lonely, angry world. You're going to get very hurtful responses. Well, God owes me. This person back that I lost. God owes me this. God, you're going to get angry responses. You're going to get, but respond how Jesus would respond. With grace and acceptance and love. And what you're going to be revealed, what you're going to see, and maybe answering this question in your own heart, you're going to see where, where you're hurting most. And what you're going to see with this question determines in your own life is the place in your heart where you've dialed into what's in it for me and how I'm serving God for, for, for me, and for what I can get. And it's going to reveal to you where you're dialed into the station. You shouldn't be. In our relationship with God, we need to move from the dial of what can God do for me into to the dial of God, what are your orders? What can I do for you? And some of you, you know what God's asking of you and some of you are running from that call because it doesn't meet your criteria. It's not convenient. It's not what you want to do with your life. It's not how you wanted your life to turn out. And some of you are running from that and going, oh. I want to encourage you this morning. God loves you no matter what station you're dialed into. But I want to encourage you this morning. There's a big difference in your relationship with Jesus. when you get on his side and say, what are my orders? If you're new to the faith or haven't met Jesus yet, I want to invite you this morning to, to surrender to your creator, the one who made you for a purpose, on purpose. You can live life dialed into what's in it for me, Ultimately, there's no satisfaction there, but yet if you dial into to God and surrender your life to Him, you'll ultimately find satisfaction and your purpose. Next week, we're going to look at the results of Jacob's decision here, and it's amazing. It's a happy ending. It's a powerful ending. It's amazing. As much as we've looked in the four weeks of the mess he made of the start of his life, the end of his life is remarkable. The end of your story can be remarkable too. You need to meet my Jesus. It doesn't matter what mess you've made of your past. Jesus stuck with you. He's with you. He wants a relationship with you. I'm going to lead us a prayer in a prayer in a minute that is so powerful. If you pray this prayer for the first time, right here in this moment, you can begin a relationship, not with a religion, not with the church, but with Jesus himself. One of his followers said, all you need to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is God. And if you believe it in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You can have a relationship with him. You can be saved. So let's make that confession with our mouth. Let's pray this prayer together. Confess together that Jesus is God. And right in this moment, you can have a relationship with him. If you're watching online, I'd encourage you to pray this prayer along with his prayer. You're at after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God and I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord, my leader, my friend. I thank you that you've forgiven me of my sins, that my past is past, that I can begin a new life 
with you right now. Jesus, I give my heart to you. I surrender.